Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to check five decades old cold cases that were solved in 2021. Welcome to Mysterious Five. The first case on our list is the case of Annette Schnee and Bobby Joe Oberholzer. In 1982 in Breckenridge, Colorado, two lifeless bodies of two different women were discovered. The crime scenes were miles from one another and the bodies were found six months apart. And yet, police believed that both women were killed on the same night by the same man. The only thing connecting them? Orange socks. On January 6, 1982, Bobby Joe Oberholzer, 29 years old, left home at 7.15am. Her day had begun as usual and she hitchhiked to work. Jeff Oberholzer was Bobby's husband. He ran an appliance repair business and she worked as a receptionist. They had been married for about four and a half years at the time of Bobby's death and they lived in Alma, 14 miles away from where her body was eventually found. At 6.20pm, Jeff got a call from Bobby saying she was having drinks with friends after work. He asked her if she wanted him to pick her up, but she told him that she would get a ride home. Jeff made dinner and waited for Bobby to come home. At some point, he fell asleep. He woke up around midnight and discovered that his wife hadn't returned. Jeff drove into Breckenridge to look for Bobby, and her friends told him she left the bar around 7.30pm. They assumed she'd gotten a ride home. When Jeff reported to police that Bobby was missing, they told him it was too early to file a report. Finally, he drove back home to wait for his wife. The next morning, a farmer who lived 30 miles outside Breckenridge found Bobby's driver's license on his property. When Jeff and two friends were on their way to pick it up, they made a disturbing discovery. Something blew in a snow-covered field. It was Bobby's backpack, the one she always had with her. Next to the backpack was one of Bobby's gloves, spattered with blood and several bloody tissues. Jeff's friends helped him organise a search. Two hours later, they found Bobby's lifeless body more than 15 miles from where her backpack was discovered. She'd been shot twice. Her house keys were found at the scene. At the crime scene, police found three intriguing clues. The only footprints near the body were from Bobby. A plastic cord was tied around one of her wrists and a single orange sock was found nearby. The same day Bobby Joe's body was found, another woman, Annette Schnee, 21 years old, was reported missing. Annette was a cocktail waitress in Frisco, Colorado, and like Bobby, often hitchhiked to and from work. Because of the similarities, both cases were immediately connected by the police. Investigators questioned Jeff about Annette. At first, he denied knowing her. However, after seeing her picture on the news, he recalled meeting her once. Jeff claimed he had once picked up Annette when she was hitchhiking and he had given her his business card but he had never seen or heard from her since that day. He also denied any involvement in her disappearance or Bobby's death. On July 3rd, 1982, six months after her disappearance and 13 miles away from where Bobby Joe's body had been found, Annette's body was discovered. Police were shocked with the discovery that she was wearing the match for the orange sock. Jeff's business card was found inside her wallet. The prime suspect immediately became Jeff Oberholzer. Authorities tried to put together a scenario for what might have happened on the night of January 6th. Annette Schnee was last seen in Breckenridge at around 4pm in deep conversation with an unidentified dark-haired woman. Police believe that around 5pm, Annette left to hitchhike home. The suspect picked her up and drove 20 miles south of Breckenridge. He took her down a small dead-end road where he assaulted her in his vehicle. While she was getting dressed, she forgot to put on her other orange sock and attempted to escape when she was shot in the back while running away. 
Police believe the suspect then drove back to Breckenridge and found his second victim, Bobby Joe Oberholzer. He drove Bobby 10 miles south of Breckenridge to a scenic overlook where he attempted to assault her. Bobby managed to escape from the vehicle where the orange sock then fell out. The suspect then chased her down the road and shot her twice as she turned away. Police felt the fact that Jeff Oberholzer knew both victims was more than just a coincidence. Two months after his wife's death, Jeff took a polygraph test and passed. From day one, Jeff insisted that he had an alibi. He said that at the time of the deaths, he was at home visiting a friend. For nearly nine years, no one could find this man. Then in December 1990, he finally surfaced and was questioned about that night. Investigators interviewed the man, who claimed that he had been in Jeff's house. However, his time and Jeff's time of the visit didn't match up. Jeff Oberholzer had always maintained his innocence and claimed that the suspect had to be someone that Bobby knew she wouldn't have left with a stranger, especially when he offered to pick Bobby up. For years, the blood found on Bobby's gloves and the tissues with her backpack were believed to be hers. However, in the early 1990s, DNA testing determined that it came from a male. The testing also determined that the blood wasn't Jeff's. As a result of this and other evidences, including several alibi witnesses, Jeff was eventually cleared as a suspect in the case. Police looked into several other suspects as well. One was cab driver Thomas Edward Luther, who in February 1982 picked up a hitchhiker in Breckenridge, then beat and insulted her. While in jail, he allegedly bragged about being responsible for the deaths. According to his girlfriend, he didn't come home on the fateful night. He also lied to investigators and said he was at work at the time. The other suspect, Tracy Petroselli, killed his fiancée in 1981 and went on a multi-state crime spree. During this time, he stayed at Annette's workplace, the Holiday Inn in Frisco. However, neither suspect's DNA matched the evidence from the crime scene. On February 24th, 2021, a 70-year-old man named Alan Lee Phillips was arrested and charged with the deaths. He was also charged with kidnapping and assaulting with a deadly weapon. He's currently being held without bail. Genetic genealogy was used to link the DNA found at the crime scene to Phillips. Investigators also suspect that he may be involved in other crimes throughout Colorado. Sadly, Bobby's brother, Kelly, and father Thomas have passed away before finding out who was responsible for taking her life. Next on the list is the case of Gail Barris. On October 9th, 1988, Gail Barris was spotted leaving a coffee shop in the early hours of the morning accompanied by a man. This was the last time Barris was ever seen alive. She was a 30-year-old single mother of three from Michigan. Life was hard, and she worked at two different local bars to be able to survive and take care of her three children. In the early hours of October 9th, 1988, between 3 and 4 a.m., Barris was spotted leaving Speed's coffee shop in Battle Creek, Michigan. She was accompanied by a dark-haired man, and that was the last time anyone saw her alive. On October 25th, Hunters from Emmett, a nearby town, made a horrifying discovery. They found a lifeless body of a woman laying on River Road. The authorities quickly identified the body to be that of Gail Barris, and an extensive investigation followed. Witnesses were identified and interviewed, and evidence was collected from the crime scene. On October 22nd, just a few days before Barris's body was discovered, and almost two weeks after her disappearance. A 24-year-old man named Roger Plato was approached by authorities. Plato's car matched the description from a victim of a different abduction and assault case. At 4.30pm, authorities attempted to detain him at gunpoint while he was walking to his car at a parking lot in Bellevue. Plato became aggressive, refused to cooperate, and started fighting back. 
He was shot when he tried to wrestle the gun from a detective, and as a result, died from the injuries. He was never interviewed. Authorities performed an autopsy, and a blood sample was taken before the body was cremated, which was stored at a private lab at the time. Investigators of Barris's case turned their attention to Plato's friend and former roommate, Richard Compton. Compton had a vast criminal career, but when approached by investigators, he backed off and denied knowing anything. With no further leads or developments, Barris's case eventually went cold. In 2018, Battle Creek cold case detective Scott Marshall reopened the case. One of his first discoveries was that Compton's DNA had never been tested, so made Compton his number one suspect. After some investigation, Detective Marshall discovered that Compton had died in 2009 and his body was buried in the County International Cemetery in Austin, Texas. Compton was just 59 years old when he died. Detective Marshall got a search warrant and travelled to Texas to exhume Compton's body. After examination, it was discovered that Compton's DNA samples didn't match that found in Barris's body, but matched previously unidentified hairs connected to the crime scene. In November 2020, a break in the case emerged almost by luck. Sergeant Chris Spassick of the Calhoun County Sheriff's Department was taking an inventory of evidence at the department and found a vial containing the blood sample taken from Plato. On January 30th, 2021, it was announced that a state police lab connected the blood to DNA found on Gail Barris's body, confirming Plato as responsible for assaulting her and taking her life. It's almost likely that Compton witnessed it happening. Both men have already died, and they never had to pay for this horrible crime. However, the Barris family has expressed their relief on finally being able to have some kind of closure. Detective Marshall said DNA technology is the future for solving cold cases. We now come to the case of Stephanie Summers. On August 30th, 1980, Stephanie Summers was supposed to spend the day with a nephew. They were going to celebrate his birthday and spend a wonderful day together. However, she never appeared. Police eventually found her lifeless body inside her apartment. Summers was a 36-year-old woman who lived in Silver Lake, Los Angeles, California. She'd only recently moved there from Newhall, Santa Clarita, and she couldn't be more excited. On that fatal day of August 30th, she was at her apartment getting ready to spend the day with her 11-year-old nephew, Kelly Roberts, from Santa Clarita Valley. She was planning to pick him up and take him to Six Flags Magic Mountain as a late birthday present. Kelly got dressed up especially for the occasion, however, his aunt never turned up. Concerned, her family contacted the authorities who went to check her apartment. That's when they made the grisly discovery. Stephanie's lifeless body was laying inside her apartment. Forensic evidence was collected at the crime scene, and an extensive investigation began. Several people were interviewed. However, the leads went nowhere, and the case went cold. The case remained unsolved for more than three decades until Los Angeles detectives received a fresh lead in 2014. It implicated a man named Harold Anthony Parkinson who lived a mile away from the victim and he could be a main suspect in the case. On June 19th, 2014, a DNA sample collected from Parkinson was consistent with the DNA profile taken from Summers' body and he was charged with taking her life. However, Parkinson was already in jail, serving between 15 years to life at the Chuckawalla Valley State Prison in Blythe for another unrelated attack. This other attack happened in Los Angeles on April 8, 1981, when he shot a man named Derek Eugene Perry. Perry succumbed to the injuries and died. Parkinson was arrested and began serving time for that sentence on March 5, 1982. Perry's sister Dolly said at the time, I remember the last meal I had with Derek. It was at a Sizzler restaurant. He gave me a hug and told me he loved me. She described her older sibling as an excellent BMX rider and surfer and a brilliant big brother. 
The motive of the attack was unknown or undisclosed by authorities. After learning that Parkinson was being accused of Summers' death, Dolly said that he is a dangerous man and should never be allowed back on the streets. In court, Parkinson's lawyer argued that his client hadn't assaulted Summers and claimed that the two were romantically involved and they slept together a few days before she was attacked. Prosecutors, however, said Summers, after a brief marriage to a man, had told friends that she was only attracted to women. Los Angeles court judge Kathleen Kennedy described Summers' case as a very degrading, horrible and violent crime. Judge Kennedy believed there was proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Parkinson was responsible for this. On February 4th, 2021, Harold Anthony Parkinson, who is now 61 years old, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Our next case is the case of Sylvia May Quayle. On August 4th, 1981, William Quayle went to visit his daughter in Cherry Hills Village near Denver, Colorado. She lived just 150 feet from his home. What he discovered was something no parent should ever have to witness. According to her friends, 34-year-old Sylvia May Quayle was ambitious, vibrant, friendly, and lit up the room when she walked in. She loved history and worked as a secretary at an architectural firm. An excellent cook, she also opened up her own business specialising in wedding cakes. Quayle had a lot of friends and was an avid artist. She loved to create pottery, many of which her sister still has in her home three decades later. She was extremely close to her family, especially her parents, who lived just 150 feet away from her home and had coffee with them every morning. Until that morning. Just before 8am on August 4th, 1981, officers were dispatched to Sylvia's house after her father found her lifeless body and called 911. Sylvia Quayle had spoken to her sister on the phone the previous night, around 11pm, so investigators knew she'd been killed between the time she hung up the phone that night and when her father got to the house nine hours later. Her father told the officers he'd arrived to find his daughter lying naked on the living room floor. Investigation revealed that she'd been shot, stabbed multiple times, strangled, assaulted. The autopsy confirmed the loss of blood was ultimately the cause of death. Investigators found two important clues at the crime scene. The telephone line in the living room and outside the house had been cut, and the bathroom window screen had been removed and tossed into some tall weeds. About 140 more pieces of evidence were collected from the scene, and over time, a variety of technological advances were used on the items as investigators tried to solve the crime. In 1983, two years after her death, Forensic technicians, using an alternate light source, found DNA material not from Sylvia in the rug where her body was found laying. The same year brought hope for investigators in the Quayle family after notorious serial killer Otis Elwood Toole confessed to have taken Sylvia's life. Many of Toole's confessions were later known to be false, along those of his companion, Henry Lee Lucas. Lucas who died in a Texas prison in 2001, claimed hundreds of victims. However, authorities were only able to confirm a handful. In 1993, the charges against Toole and Sylvia's death were dropped. At the time, DNA testing on evidence in the case had proven that Toole was not the source of the DNA found at the crime scene 12 years earlier. In 1995, a section of the rug was cut out and submitted to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation to be tested. Five years later, the sample provided authorities with an unknown male DNA profile. However, no match was found and the case went cold. In January 2020, Cherry Hills Village cold case detectives and investigators decided to use the recent technology of genetic genealogy in Sylvia's case. Four months later, a name surfaced. David Dwayne Anderson. 
At the time of Sylvia's death, Anderson, then 22 years old, lived a couple of miles away from her. Cold case detectives began investigating Anderson. One particular investigator, Robert Fuller, travelled to Kozad, where Anderson now lived, to secretly collect the suspect's DNA. Fuller was able to recover two trash bags Anderson had tossed into a dumpster. Inside were 15 items that potentially held Anderson's genetic material. Included among the items was a vanilla Coke can. On January 29th, 2021, genetic material taken out of the vanilla Coke can matched the ones found in the body and crime scene. When investigators looked into Anderson's past, they found a string of at least eight home and business burglaries between 1981 and 1986. In one of the home burglaries, he removed and tossed a window screen to gain entrance. Anderson, now 62 years old, was arrested on February 10th, 2021. The first photograph is of Anderson in 1980. If anyone recognizes this photograph of him from this time period and has information surrounding or involving this case, we ask that you please call the Cherry Hills Village Police Department tip line at 720-305-9831. William and Mary Quayle didn't live to see their daughter's killer charged. William died in 1999 and his wife followed 10 years later. Our final case is the case of Bonnie Baker. On the night of June 30th, 1998, Baker was celebrating her recent promotion with some friends. Her boyfriend at the time showed up unexpectedly to the party. After a few tense moments, they both left and that was the last time she was ever seen alive. Bonnie Baker was a 47-year-old woman from Denver, Colorado where she shared an apartment with a boyfriend, Crespin Nene Perez. The couple had met at the Fort restaurant in Morrison, where they both worked. Baker was the perfect employee, never calling in sick, and always showing up on time. The same couldn't be said about Perez, who had been fired a month earlier for missing work. Baker decided to celebrate her recent promotion with her friends at one of their places in Golden, they planned to spend the night partying. The night quickly turned for the worse after Baker's boyfriend unexpectedly showed up to the friend's place. Perez arrived at the party and almost immediately started to make a scene. He was jealous seeing his girlfriend drinking and dancing with the friends in the living room. Several witnesses at the party later said that Perez looked as if he had taken illicit substances. His eyes were red and glazed and he was very aggressive. He also continuously eyed everyone off at the party, attempting to instigate a fight with anyone who stared back. Baker's last known words to a friend were, it would be better if I just go now, or it will be worse. The pair left the party early when the situation became heated. At around 8pm that night, authorities received a phone call from an unidentified woman. She reported that a man had taken a woman's life in an apartment on West Louisiana Avenue. She also claimed that the man was about to drive to Mexico in a red vehicle with Colorado license plates, and the woman's body was in the trunk, which she was planning to dump somewhere along the way. When tracing the call, police found that it was made from a payphone, so they rushed to the address given. In the apartment, there were no signs of a struggle, and no one was found. The next day, Perez's car was involved in a single vehicle collision near Globe, Arizona, but he fled the scene on foot. The car ended up being impounded, and upon examination, blood was collected from the trunk as evidence. The case was shelved, but was reinvestigated a year later due to possible new evidence. On July 31st, 1999, Two boys went horseback riding in a remote part of a Navajo reservation in New Mexico. They stumbled across what appeared to be a human skull and immediately contacted authorities. After searching the area, investigators found several more skeletal remains. Despite the find, the results of the autopsy and the reason for the death remained inconclusive. 
The case went cold due to the lack of evidence and correlation between Baker, the missing person, and the found remains. In October of 2012, cold case detective Kenneth Klaus from Denver was assigned Baker's case and immediately called an FBI agent in New Mexico to discuss her disappearance. DNA samples from the remains found on the Navajo Reservation were sent to Denver's crime lab for forensic testing. They matched samples collected from Bonnie Baker. On April 4th, 2013, the unknown female caller came forward admitting that she was the one who called 911 the night of Baker's disappearance. She also claimed that she cleaned out the couple's apartment after their disappearance and before the authorities arrived where broken plates and glass covered the floor and the kitchen table was overturned. The unidentified woman also gave a full description of the red vehicle which was later determined to be a Geo Prism as well as its license plate number. And according to the woman, Perez told her that night, I know that you don't like Bonnie. Something bad happened to us. You'll never have to see Bonnie again because I'm going to make her disappear. This woman's relationship with the couple was not yet revealed by the authorities. Another witness also identified Perez as the driver of the Red Geo from a photo lineup. After further rounds of witness interviews and forensic DNA testing, the gathered evidence concluded that there was enough ground to arrest Crespin Nene Perez. A warrant was issued for Perez's arrest, but the arrest couldn't be made as he was now living in Mexico. His extradition to the United States didn't happen until 2020. Prosecutors theorized that Baker's body was likely left in a shallow grave within a day of a disappearance. On January 27, 2021, a preliminary reading in the case was held in Denver court and Perez faces charges for abducting and taking Baker's life. If you found this interesting, then be sure to like, subscribe and hit the bell button. You don't want to miss out what other mysteries are waiting for you. As always, thanks for watching.